Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Joan Fontaine, George Brent, and Don DeFore in The Affairs of Susan. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Mitchell Lyson. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. It's two days before Halloween, when almost anything can happen. So we're jumping the gun a little to introduce Miss Susan Darrell, to whom anything can happen and a lot of things do, owing largely to her own capricious nature and the arrows of outrageous fortune. You meet her in Hal Wallace's production, The Affairs of Susan, a paramount picture, starring Joan Fontaine in what I think we can refer to as the title role, with George Brent and his rival suitor of our drama, Don DeFore, as co-stars. All are cast in their original screen roles, in a merry-go-round story of a highly unpredictable woman and the four persistent men in love with her. Of Joan Fontaine, I, I have some vivid recollections from the last time I was on location with her. We were shooting a picture up near Albion in Northern California, where there was something of a housing shortage. Joan took a large house and proved a marvelous daytime hostess to our company. Not to be outdone, I made myself proprietor of the local inn, supplying room and board and doubling in the kitchen for the chef. Well, the result is I've developed a yen for whipping up special dishes with the slightest excuse so that all my friends realize if they want to spend a weekend on my boat, all they have to do is praise my cooking and they're sure of an invitation. However, I play safe, and I make sure there's a package of Lux Flakes tucked in with the supplies. And no matter how much of a mess I make of the galley, Carl, my steward, just reaches for the Lux and grins happily as he plunges the dishes into a foaming, bubbling basin of Lux Flakes. And speaking of plunging, let's plunge into the first act of The Affairs of Susan, starring Joan Fontaine as Susan, George Brent as Roger Burton, and Don DeFore as Mike Ward. <laughs> It wouldn't be quite fair to describe Mr. Richard Aiken as stuffy. Conservative is better. And in all his 40 highly conservative years, Mr. Aiken never has spent such an exciting day as this. Five hours ago, the radiant and celebrated actress, Miss Susan Darrell, agreed to marry him. And five minutes ago, he received a piece of news that quite naturally sent him rushing to the telephone. Hello? Susan, darling, the most wonderful thing's happened. Richard? Well, of course it's Richard. What, what did you think it was, Susan? Oh, darling, I've been so worried rushing away from our party like that. But, honey, it was the office, and wait till I tell you. Susan, the president, has just appointed me regional coordinator of the National Aeronautical Bureau of Reconversion. Why, that's wonderful. And you know what? I have to go to the coast right away. Tonight. Tonight? For a week, and then I'll be stationed in Washington. What do you think about living in Washington? Well, I think... Oh, I knew you would. Just imagine, here we are practically on our way to Los Angeles. We are? And we can be married at, at my mother's house in Pasadena. Richard, uh, couldn't we wait until you get back from the coast well, and then maybe... You love me, don't you, Susan? Oh, of course, Richard. Well, if I leave you here, I... Oh, Susan, you can make it, can't you? Well, I guess so. But some of the people are still here from the cocktail party still and I... Still there? Who? Not Roger Burton. Oh, no. William uh... Anthony? That writer? Oh, I'm... Darling, he left right after you did, and so did Michael Ward. Oh. Did they upset you, Richard? But I keep telling you, dear, you really know so little about what me. What have they got to do with my knowing you? Oh, no, 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 don't answer that now, darling. Now, I suggest you start packing your things, and I'll pick you up at 11 o'clock. I'd come earlier, except that, well, I'd been rather tied up for a while, so why don't you get rid of those people and take a little Richard, nap if you can? Just as long as you're all ready to leave at 11 o'clock. Oh, I'm a very happy I'll man, Susan. Well, goodbye, I'll darling, and I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Come in. Come in. Oh, hello there, Mr. Burton. And Mr. Ward, Mr. Anthony. Well, so you were all able to make it, hmm? Look here, Aiken, what's this all about? I told you once what it was all about. At the party this afternoon, the three of us told Aiken to call on us if we could be of any help to him. And you can be of help, definitely. Oh, I'm very happy Mr. Burton was able to get a hold of you. What kind of help? Well, it's really very simple. Susan is about to become my wife. But I haven't uh, known Susan very long. I haven't had time to, uh, well, to study her. And this afternoon, well, I'm afraid each one of you gave me an entirely different picture of my fiancé. Oh, no. oh, no. oh, no. oh, no. And so I invited you to dinner, so you can tell me all you know about Susan. I want to know where you fail, so uh, I won't make the same mistakes. <laughs> I don't see any dinner. It's all ready. You'll just step inside, gentlemen. <laughs> well, this is nice. Well, go ahead. Let's get it over with. And 
now I'd like to propose a toast to my fiance, to Susan. But I wonder which Susan. Uh, gentlemen, I'm a little upset. Now, wait a minute, Aiken. If you think I'm going to sit here and blab my head off about Susan, you're nuts. Bill's right. I'm getting out of here, but too. Now, please. I love Susan. And I thought you'd all want to see her happy, too. Certainly. And the more he knows about Susan, the better chance he has. Oh, so you're going to pour your little heart out. I have to. Mike has evidently given the impression that Susan is nothing but a party girl, and you with that. Yeah? Thing. Well, you must have convinced him that she's an, inter an intellectual or a brain trust. And uh, I, I'll, but I'll tell him about the real Susan. Well, Aiken, I might as well begin at the beginning. The Susan I first knew, the truthful, earthy, sincere Susan. Well, look, you fellows, are you going to go? Go. Yeah, come on, Mike. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe I'd better listen to this. Matter of fact, I don't trust Roger either. Well, Aiken, when I first met your future bride, she was very young. I was fed up with Broadway. Everywhere I turned, there were a million would-be actresses. You see, I'm a producer. Oh, yes, yes. So I ran up to Rhode Island and took a little cabin on the most desolate spot I could find. But it wasn't desolate enough. An actress by the name of Mona Kent followed me up there. Ha! Shut up. But I outwitted her. I ran away. Well, that is, I rode away. Clear across the bay until I found an island. It had one house on it. I made a deal with the old man to put me up for a while. That evening, I found out that I wasn't as smart as I figured. All right, all right, come out of there. I'm talking to you. What are you doing there? I live here. Really? My name's Susan. Well, you're wasting your time. I came up here to read a play called Joan of Arc, which I probably won't produce anyhow. You understand? I'm afraid I don't. And why are you singing? Why does anybody sing? Because I'm happy, I guess. Happy? Where did you rent that costume? Well, these are my work pants. Well, you're not going to work it on me, see? You know who I am, don't you? The new boarder, Uncle Jemmy told me. You also know my name, don't you? No. Roger Burton! Well, what are you mad about? Furthermore, you know that I'm a well-known producer, don't you? What do you produce? Uh, are you trying to rib me? I produce plays. Oh, plays. What do you think I produced? Oh, something important, maybe. Wheat or locomotives Are you or... sure you didn't know who I am? No. You never saw my name in the papers? Oh, I never read the newspapers. Why not? Well, because they're full of, of murders and robberies and people who say awful things about one another. I like happy things. Hmm. Where do you find them? Oh, in books sometimes. And sometimes in plays, huh? No. No, I never read plays. Oh, come now. You'd like to be an actress, though, wouldn't you? I haven't time for such foolishness. Foolishness? A lot of people wearing makeup and pretending to be somebody they aren't. Oh, it's ridiculous. Well, now I've seen everything. You didn't know who I was, did you? No. Oh, that's right. You, you didn't know who I was. Well, well you see, uh, I'm kind of important. That is, I, I... Well, now, I think I just might have a few clippings with me. Uh, reviews of my last plays. Uh, uh, here, there. I'll read them after supper. Uncle Jemmy's coming. He might think you were crazy or something. Yeah. Well, uh, let's change the subject. You know, after supper, I thought I might climb those cliffs down at the shore. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? Well, don't you think you're too old to be climbing cliffs? <sighs> well, Aiken, that's how I met Susan Darrell. One night about a week later, I was in the front room reading the script of Joan of Arc. Uncle Jamie had gone to bed, and so had Susan. At least I thought she had. I couldn't sleep. I was wondering if you'd do me a favor, Roger. What kind of a favor? Here, fix my clock. Ooh, aren't you uh, a little chilly? Oh, no, I'm fine. Oh, well, uh, what's the matter with the clock? It doesn't seem to know what time it is. See? Uh, 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 pardon me. Yes? Well, uh, you're standing a little too close. Uh, you're in my light. Oh, oh, I'll get around on the other side of your chair. Yeah, but I've... Uh, uh, never mind. Look, I can't fix clocks. I, I'm sorry, and you'd better go back to bed. Well, it's ticking now, see? But the hands won't move. They... Dad, you don't sit there. Oh, Oh, I didn't know you didn't like people to sit on the arm of your chair. Well, I don't. Uncle Jemmy loves to have me sit on the arm of his chair. Well, your Uncle Jemmy's a very old man. I'm just old. Besides, he's your uncle. Well, what do you mean by that? What do I mean? Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, if it's the clock that's making you so cross, just forget that it. That clock isn't making me cross. I'd be cross without a clock. Why don't you go to bed? Why should people go to bed when they don't... Where are you going? Out to get some air. Please wait for me. Now, what do you want? Mm, nothing. I, well, I just thought I'd maybe help you get whatever is bothering you off your mind. Mm. Button your coat. Yes, sir. Doesn't it occur to you that I might be running away from you? But I, I thought you liked me. I do. 
But then why do you run away from me? I, I don't understand. I don't think you do at that. Explain, please. Now, now, look. You said you were going to help me get what was bothering me off my mind, didn't you? All right, then. Don't talk. Just walk. And don't say anything. No, not talking doesn't do any good either. It's, uh, it's pretty night, isn't it? Well, I, I never thought about the night as being pretty. Pretty isn't a big enough word for the night. It's beautiful and mysterious and magnificent. I see what you mean. A million voices calling out through a veil of tears. What's that? Oh, just a line that Joan of Arc was supposed to have said. You know about Joan of Arc? Mm-hmm. She listened to the voices of the stars and the trees and the night, and they called her a witch. That's right. But it's true. Trees do murmur, and the ocean roars and bellows when the tide comes in and whispers when it goes out. And they're saying things. If only we'd listen. And you understand them? Well, of course. They're telling us to be kind and to be truthful and to be happy. Come on. Why? Where are we going? Never mind. Just come on. But what have I done now? Roger, wait for me. What have I done now? My goodness, Mr. Burton. Something wrong? No, no, no. Nothing's wrong, Uncle Jimmy. Slamming all over the place. Hey, Susan. Oh, we've just been walking on the beach, Uncle Jerry. Here, Susan, here, read this. You have, huh? Uh, read it. There, 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 where it says Joan of Arc. It's, it's a play script. And so you condemned to death the girl. Now, wait, 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 wait a minute. Now, look. You were Joan of Arc, and you're being burned at the stake. Land sakes, what for? What for? for uh, because she's a great savior, a brilliant woman, honest and earthy and sincere. Because she's a saint. For goodness sake. Yeah, for goodness sake. Go ahead, Susan. And so you condemned to death the maid whose only fault was being true. The voices that I hear in the winds and in the trees and from the blue, blue sky are louder and clearer than all the rattlings of your chains and the crackling of your fires. You think you kill me? You give me life. Keep it talking for a woman to say when she's burning. Susan, you've got it. Got what? The voice, the quality, everything. I'm going to make an actress out of you. An actress? But I, I don't want to be an actress. Do you think I meet people like you every day? Oh, but actress. Don't argue with me! Well, don't shout at me. I don't want to oh, be one. listen, you little idiot. I'm going to make you famous, a star on Broadway. I don't want to be a star on Broadway. But, Sue, honey, it pays better in housekeeping. I don't want to be an actress. I don't want to be an actress. All right. Now try it once again. And the voices that I hear in the wind and the trees and the blue, blue sky are louder and clearer to me than all the rattlings of your chains and the cracklings of your fires. You think you kill me? You give me life. Perfect. But, Roger, I don't want to be an actress. Uh, you're going to start that all over again. What do you want to be, stuck in this mud flat the rest of your life? It's not a mud flat. It's a beautiful island, and I love it. Oh, instead of being a silly little country girl on your beautiful island, you're going to be a celebrated woman. Dozens of men will fight over you. Women will... Oh, I don't want Don't that. be ridiculous. Every woman likes to have men running after her. I've had that. I've had... I'm going back to my room and lock myself. Susan? Susan, I, I want to speak to you. Oh, Susan, please, open the door. What do you want? Well, I, I'm i sorry I yelled at you. I, we've been rehearsing so much, and I suppose I, I'm a little on edge. Well, I'm sorry, too. Yeah, why? Why, you were so excited, you forgot to tell the truth. I did? Yes, you uh, said you had lots of men run after you. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, what? Well... Last year, the Coast Guard anchored off here all day. They were all over the island. Oh, oh, you're a charming child, Susan. I'm not a child. You've never been in love, have you? No. And I don't suppose you've ever had anybody in love with you either, have you? Yes. Yeah, you have? The mailman. Oh, well, that old geezer, why, he's old enough to be your grandfather. Oh, that's the new mailman. There was an old one, you know. The new mailman is old, but the old mailman is young. Oh, I see. And he was in love with you? Well, he said so. He was trying to kiss me all the time. Did you let him? Of course not. Why? Oh, it's kind of silly. And he said I'd love it if I did. But I didn't. What's the matter? Uh, look, Susan. In a few days, we'll be going to New York. I think I'd better tell you something right now. I... I'm in love with you, Susan. Oh, but of course. I love you, too. Didn't you know that? No, no, no. I, I don't think you quite understand. I said I was in love with you. Well, is there any difference? Oh, quite a difference. I love football and tenderloin steaks, but I'm not in love with them. I'm in love with you. Well, that's what I meant, too. Yeah, but how do you know? Well, I'm going to be an actress, am I not? 
And I didn't want to be, and I've learned all those speeches, and I've let you shout at me and bully me, and I did what you wanted me to, didn't I? Isn't that being in love? Yes, I guess it is. Will you marry me, Susan? I certainly will. Uh, tell me, do you think it would be silly if I kissed you? Well, I'd have to try it first. Well, what's the verdict? That's nice. Oh, that's very nice. In fact, now I'm sorry about the mailman. Before our stars return with Act Two of the Affairs of Susan, I want to welcome back to the Lux Radio Theater a personal friend and one of the most important figures on the Paramount lot. She deals in figures of a very special kind. Miss Edith Head, the first woman to be head designer for a major studio. Miss Head was responsible for those exciting clothes in Masquerade in Mexico, the latest picture I directed for Paramount. And it was one of the biggest jobs I ever handled, Mr. Lysen, but I loved it. I had a chance to design so many different kinds of things, sport clothes and bathing suits, as well as glamorous evening gowns. And you did a superb job on those costumes for the Mexican ballet. Well, Mexico is a real inspiration for costume design. Edith, what kind of fabrics were they made of, anyhow? Oh, mostly cottons and linens. But how did you keep them so fresh? Some of those scenes took a lot of time to film. Oh, Lux took care of that. Most of them were washed every night. After the day shooting, the wardrobe girls would round them up, lux them, and press them. Next morning, they'd look as lovely as ever. You know, I never detected any change. Of course not. Lux is wonderfully kind of fabrics and colors stay lovely longer. Isn't that so, Mr. Kennedy? You have laboratory tests to back you up, Miss Head. They show Lux Care keeps colors lovely up to three times as long. We found at Paramount that's true. We won't risk strong soaps. In designing clothes for the stars, I suppose you study their figures as carefully as a director does their best camera angles. Yes, indeed. But if a star has an unusually good feature, I play that up. Dorothy Lamour has a naturally slender waist, so I accented that in the clothes I designed for her in Masquerade in Mexico. Well, you certainly made her as lovely as, in a, as a Latin as you did in a cell. <laughs> but she has more changes of costume. Equally luxable? That's right, Mr. Kennedy. At Paramount, we depend on Lux for everything safe in water. A thrifty rule for women everywhere. Strong soap, hot water, and rough handling soon fade colors, make them drab and old-looking. So trust pretty colors to gentle Lux if you'd keep them new-looking longer. Here's Mitchell Lyson, our guest producer. Act Two of The Affairs of Susan, starring Joan Fontaine as the lady in question, George Brent as Roger Burton, and Don DeFore as Mike Ward. <laughs> So Richard Aiken wanted to find out about his bride-to-be, did he? Well, Richard Aiken is finding out plenty. His source of information continued to be Roger Burton. Now, let's see. Where was I? Uh, she kissed you. Susan kissed you. Yes, Richard. <laughs> uh, oh, and then she married me and came to Broadway. Okay, you finished? Now, wait a minute, Nancy. I'm the one who comes in next. Now, relax, both of you. I haven't told Aiken the good part yet. You, you, you haven't? No. The night Joan of Arc opened, who should barge into Susan's dressing room but Mona Kent? You remember Mona? The blonde gazelle who chased me all the way to Rhode Island? Well, Mona was very sweet to Susan. Even brought her a pint of brandy. Mona always said there was nothing like a, a little brandy to settle the nerves. By curtain time, Susan, who had never tasted anything stronger than clam juice, was pie-eyed. Well, we managed to hold the audience, and thanks to a doctor and a quart of black coffee, she finally got ready to go on the stage. I'm all right now, really, I am. Oh, how could you fall for a trick like that? Couldn't you see what Mona was up to? But she said that you would send her. Oh, boy, I'll fix her if it's the last thing I do. She'll never get another job on Broadway. She You're won't even be able Carl. to carry a spear. <laughs> uh, You're waiting, Miss Carl. Good luck, darling. Thank you. Susan was the greatest Joan of Arc the stage has ever seen. Yes, Aiken, that's what all the critics said. But I lost my shirt. That season, everybody wanted to see musicals. Still, I would have gotten most of my dough back if Susan hadn't run into a couple of reporters. But I only told them what you told me, Roger. I distinctly remember you saying that we hadn't taken in enough money to pay the ushers oh, and that... Oh, but you didn't tell that to the reporters. You couldn't have. And that it's a fine play, but nobody wants to see it. Was that wrong? Wrong? Why, you've only wrecked every chance I ever had of getting any new money for the play and uh, to keep the play going. Darling, won't you please stop being so outspoken? You've got to adapt yourself. I'm sorry, Roger. I'll try to... Well, a month later, I found a gentleman with a lot of money and an interest in the theater. His name was Donald H. Cusp, and he promised to back my new show. So I threw a dinner party. Life, however, is full of little surprises. And guess who Mr. Cusp brought to our dinner party? That's right, Miss Mona Kent. 
Oh, Mr. Cusp, I, I didn't even know that you knew Mona. Why, well, here, Mona and I are old friends. And just think, Roger, Donald and I are engaged. Who? <laughs> engaged? Oh, to be married? But of course. Oh, where's Susan? Oh, well, well she's around somewhere. Uh, shall we go inside? Just a second, Roger. Uh, love boat. Yes, yeah, sweetie pie. Let's ask Roger right away. Roger, we've been hoping that possibly you could find a small part for me in the new play. Oh, uh, sure, Mona. Because I think I'm a little old for the lead. Oh, nonsense. Oh, oh, oh. But, uh, of course you're not too old. And that settles him. She plays the lead, right, Mr. Benton? Certainly. Had you in mind all the time. Uh, oh, uh, Mona, uh, will you introduce Mr. Cust to all the people, huh? I I'll go and get you a drink. Oh, Mrs. Oakley. Well, Roger's been looking all over for you, dear. Oh, he'll find me. I'm being very good and not saying... Oh. What's the matter, dear? Your diet hasn't helped you a bit, has it? I've lost over two pounds. You have, really? Well, you don't look it. Why, Susan. And what are you doing here? Oh, you'll find out, darling. Roger has just given me the lead in his new show. But you're crazy. Roger wouldn't even let you carry a spear. Oh, Susan, Susan, <laughs> I've been looking all over for you. Oh, uh, uh, this uh, this is Mr. Cusp, dear. How do you do, Mr. Cusp? Uh, you remember my speaking about Mr. Cusp, don't you, dear? Uh, Mr. Cusp is also a friend of Miss Kent. In fact, Miss Kent is engaged to Mr. Cusp, which I think calls for congratulations. And, uh, of course, you remember Miss Kent, dear? Yes, I have met Miss Kent, and I'd rather not have met Miss Kent again. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, don't you mind my wife, Mr. Cusp. Just a river at heart. You're <laughs> only being polite to her only because she's in our house. Isn't that true, Roger? Well, I haven't learned that lesson yet, so will you please get out, Miss Kent? Uh, uh, Susan, well, I'm afraid I don't understand all this Broadway humor at all. You look like a very nice little man, Mr. Cusp. If I were you, I wouldn't have anything to do with Miss Kent. She's not a very nice person. This is an outrage. Let's get out of here. Okay. But let me tell you something, sweetheart. I'm not even listening. That precious husband of yours would get down on his knees to have me do this show. But he won't have to, because there isn't going to be any show. Come on, love boat. <laughs> But I just couldn't help it, Roger. I was only telling the truth. Oh, the truth. Who told you to tell the truth all the time? It just isn't civilized. Look what you did tonight. Made me lose a man with $50,000, and everybody in New York will be laughing at me. I guess you're telling me that I'm pretty stupid, I guess. That's what you're saying, isn't it, Roger? Well, you want it that way, yes. Well, I guess we both made a mistake. Maybe we did. I know I did. I loved you because you were decent and honest, but I also thought you were human. I'm human, Roger. You're too perfect to be human. You're like a goddess. Well, you can love a goddess, and maybe you can live with one on Olympus, but not on 74th Street. Poor Susan. Poor Susan. Oh, what do you mean, poor Susan? Well, there's Susan's fiancé. You, you keep out of this. You make the whole thing look as if it was all my fault, even the divorce. It was your fault. After knowing you, that poor little kid was afraid to tell the truth. Oh, Mike, you're a cluck, a pigeon. You haven't changed since the night you wanted to the Mayfair bar fresh from Montana. The bankroll as big as a cabbage and an accent like the Lone Ranger. Well, the minute I saw you, I knew I'd found a new backer. I'd scarcely call that ethical, Mr. Burton. Oh, go on. Mike loved it. He ate it up. When I invited him to my office the, the next day to help me cast a line of chorus girls, he almost swooned. And while we were waiting for the girls, someone else... Burton Productions. Just one moment, please. I'll see. Burton Productions. Hello, Tommy. Mr. Burton doing any casting today? I'm sorry. You'll have to come back in a... Well, I didn't even recognize you, Miss Darrell. Oh, these clothes, they are a little gay, aren't they? <laughs> you haven't changed in months. <sighs> I just got in from Reno this morning. Oh, I was sorry to hear about that. Of course you were. Do you think I could see Mr. Burton for a minute? Why, say to... Uh... Oh, uh, well, as a matter of fact, he's pretty busy. He's got a new angel, name of Ward. Boss is kind of pouring it on, and, well, you know how you are, Miss Darrell. This is no time for the truth. I suppose I was a pretty little stupid, pretty stupid little girl, wasn't I? Oh, Mr. Saunders, we're the girls from the Grand Dancing Academy. Oh, yes, well, now, just a minute. Uh, perhaps you can drop back later, Miss Darrell? Well, I guess I could. there, girls. Yes? The girls are here, Mr. Burton. Send them in. This way, girls. All right, now. Line up, girls, line up. Let's see what your legs look like. Snap it up. Uh, pardon me a second, Mr. Ward. Oh, take your time. This is swell. This is like a flower show. Uh, okay, what's your name? Uh, Alice Andrews. Okay, and you? Zelda Hughes. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Your name? Hello. Uh, oh, Susan. Oh, hey, Tommy. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
say, how does she get yeah, in? How you, uh, the, the rest of the girls are all right. Hey, get them out of here. That's all, girls. Thank you very much. Okay, kids, okay. Out you go, out you go. Uh, Susan, come on out in the other office. I want to talk to you. Oh, but first I want to meet Mr. Ward. What do you think you're doing? Adapting myself. Well, if he won't introduce us, Mr. Ward, I yeah. guess I'll have... Oh, there, Mr. Ward, uh, this is Miss Susan Darrell, a very splendid actress. How do you do? Yeah, now, if you don't mm. mind... I... Don't interrupt me, sweetie pie. I think it's awfully important for the producer and the leading lady to be good friends, don't you, Mr. Ward? Well, yes, I guess so. Now, look, now, look, Susan, now, I don't know what you're up to, but there's no part in this show for you, and furthermore, Mr. Ward is just contemplating taking an interest. He hasn't taken it yet. Oh, don't be silly, Roger. If I do the play, you'd want to be in on it, wouldn't you? Well, uh, <laughs> oh, gosh... You mean you'd take a chance on me? Oh, I sure would, Miss... Uh, Susan? Roger, wherever did you get this wonderful man? He's a regular old love boat. Uh, uh, listen, Susan, I told you there's nothing in the show for you. But you said I was the perfect actress for the part. When did I say that? The other day, on your yacht. Yacht? <laughs> well, I haven't even got a yacht. Oh, don't <laughs> mind him, Mike. He's just a river at heart. Now, why don't you and I run out and have some lunch? Say, that'd be fine. I'll have him back by 3 o'clock, Roger. Is that all right? Oh, that's just ducky. Bye, love boat. Well, I guess I saw Susan every day for the next five weeks while Roger was getting his new show together. And then one night, while we were sitting in one of those nightclubs... Happy, Mike. Happy? Oh, I'm happy as a chipmunk on a chinkapin log. Susan, honey, there's something I just got to tell you. Oh, Mike, darling, I know what you want to say. Well, for Carl's sake, then help me say it. If I were going to marry anybody, it'd be you, Mike. But as long hello, as... Hello, Susan. Uh, uh, hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Roger. Uh, mind if I uh, dance with Susan? Well, we were just talking about something, but of course, if Susan would like to dance... I'll be right back, Mike. Are you losing your mind, chasing all over town till all hours of the morning? Who do you think you're fooling? Not you. Certainly not me. You're no glamour girl, and you know it. So why don't you stop pretending? Maybe I'm not pretending. Maybe I was pretending when I was that simple little country girl. Did you ever think of that? Now, Susan, if you think you're going to make me jealous... Make you jealous? Why, you egotistical, let go of Come me. on, I'm on dance. Poor Mike. Poor Mike. Did it ever occur to you that I might be in love with poor Mike? Yes, and when I did, I stood up half the night laughing. That <laughs> might interest you to know that he was proposing to me just now. You wouldn't marry him and you know it. Oh, I wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, because you're still in love with me. Well, that does it. Oh, now, Susan, Susan, where are you going? Susan! Uh... Susan! Susan! Who let you in my apartment? Your maid. Well, tell Nancy to let you out again. But she can't. Nancy's gone to the market. I want to talk to you. Sorry, I'm dressing. At 12 noon? Now, Susan, look. I've been up all night thinking about us. I can't hear you. I say I've been up all night. Well, go to bed. Uh, Susan, uh, maybe we've made a big mistake. You see, I... What? Uh, I, I say we've made a big... Uh, oh, uh, wait till I answer that infernal door. Oh, hold your horses. I'm coming. Oh, hi, Roger. Oh, hello, Mike. Oh, hey, uh, what's the idea of the bag? I'm catching the 4 o'clock train back to Montana. Oh, going home, eh? Well, well, I suppose it's all for the best. Oh, but I'm coming back next week. You're coming... Uh, huh? What? Sure. sure. I'm selling out my business, and then we're going to be married. Mm. Didn't Susan tell you? Good morning, Mike, mm. darling. Oh, Susan, honey. Mike, you break my <laughs> ribs. Now then, Roger, what were you screaming at me through that door? Who made a mistake? Oh, nothing. I guess I did. Mike, why don't you run into the kitchen and whip up some of those special scrambled eggs? I'm starved. Say, that's a good idea. Boy, that's one thing I can cook, scrambled eggs. Look at him. Look at him. He's not walking. He's floating. Well, I'm glad he's so happy. He's not happy. He's hypnotized. Adapt yourself, he said. Adapt yourself. Yeah, well, you didn't adapt yourself. You just went to the other extreme. You took a shrinking little violet and painted and perfumed until there's nothing left but a complete phony. The violet's gone. With it. Oh, I guess you're right. I'm a fool. You hate me, don't you? Oh, no, no. Don't get yourself all worked up. But you do, you do. Everybody hates me. Maybe I am dishonest, but I did it only to hold Mike and not lose him the way I lost oh, him. Oh, no, Susan, please. I, oh. I just mean to hurt you. Oh, now, come here. Now, now, put your head here on my shoulder. I... I... Oh. Well, Mike, you haven't got the eggs done already. I, uh, I couldn't find the butter. Oh, well, it's in the icebox. Yeah, well, I guess I better be going. So long, everybody. 
seems in an awful big hurry, doesn't he? Then he's so I don't like him. Always hanging around and... Say, have you been crying, honey? Oh, no. No, it's nothing. Is there something he's done? No. Well, no, he only said that... What? That his brother just passed away. I felt so sorry for him. That's why I'm crying. Oh, well. Oh, well, gosh. Come to the end of the trail, huh? Well, that's life. Death. Yeah. What'd you say the butter was? In the icebox. Mike, I feel awful. I think I'll go lie down for a while. Okay, honey. You go lie down now, and I'll take a walk around the block. <laughs> station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Joe 
Joan Fontaine, George Brent, and Don DeFore return in a moment for the last act of The Affairs of Susan. What were you doing today, Libby? Mm, stargazing. In the daytime? Mm-hmm. Well, I was over at Paramount last week and saw Veronica Lake. I'd like that kind of stargazing. Oh, uh, she was looking wonderful in preparation for the big event you read about. She's just back from a fishing trip with her husband. A vacation? Yes, from her latest picture, Hold That Blonde. And I don't wonder. It's so strenuous, all full of cops and robbers and chasers. A mystery? Yes, and a hilarious one. She and Eddie Bracken get mixed up in all sorts of funny complications. So a quiet little fishing trip was quite a change, huh? Mm-hmm, that's right. Veronica and her husband have a cunning little cabin up in the North Woods. Where they rough it? Including doing their own housework. Imagine Veronica doing the dishes. A pretty sight, I imagine. When she told me she did, I sort of sneaked a look at her hands. She caught me doing it, and then she laughed and said, uh, looking for dishpan hands? Oh, you were embarrassed, huh? Oh, I just laughed and said, well, I don't see any sign of them. Maybe it's luck. And then she told me she always does use luck up there for her dishes. Just because it takes such good care of her hands. So when a movie star turns homemaker, she's just like other women. Oh, yes. No woman wants her hands to look rough and unattractive. And she needn't. With gentle, thrifty Lux Flakes, the difference it makes in your hands is really amazing. Why, even if strong soaps have left them very red and rough, simply changing to Lux will take that red look away. Quickly, too. A great many tests have proved this. And yet it costs so little to use Lux for dishes, Mr. Kennedy. Because Lux goes further. Does up to twice as many dishes, ounce per ounce, as other soaps tested. Remember, it's thrifty Lux for lovely hands. Here's Mitchell Lyson at the microphone. After the play, be sure to join us for a brief chat with tonight's stars and an important announcement for next week. Meanwhile, here's Act Three of The Affairs of Susan, starring Joan Fontaine as Susan, George Brent as Roger, and Don DeFore as Mike. <laughs> Two down and one to go. Roger Burton has related his chapter in The Affairs of Susan. Mike Ward has just finished his account, and now, more confused than ever, Richard Aiken, the bridegroom-to-be, directs a rather wan expression toward Bill Anthony. Well, Aiken, after that childish episode in Burton's apartment, Mike here went galloping back to Montana. Yeah, but I couldn't stand it, though. Came right back to New York. But Susan would have no part of him, naturally. Well, not for a while, maybe. But one day I got a message that Susan wanted to see me. Well, boy, I was up in the clouds again. Yeah, I got the same message about the same Just time. Just a minute, I... Burton. Well, when I got to her apartment... Shut up! If my story's to be told, I'll tell it my own way. Susan entered my life, Aitken, about the time my new book had been published, Man Has a Mission. But, of course, you've read it. No, I don't think I have. Can't you read? Uh, well, I'm sorry. I but... don't apologize. Anyway, I was in a bookstore when I heard Susan inquire about a book on marriage. I felt it my duty to take her aside. Feel, yes, I'm not against the institution of marriage, but... You just don't believe in it. Well, I don't know. As I said, so often the wrong people marry, and so rarely the right people. Are you married? No. But suppose, for instance, I found in you exactly the right person for me to love, and you felt the same way. We'd fall in love, beautiful, but what do we do to retain that love? Well, in the first Nothing. Place... That's the trouble. The exquisite beauty of the courtship vanishes completely. What's your name, anyway? William Anthony. Oh, I thought you sounded like something I'd read. Did you like my book? Well, yes, I think I did. Thank you, Miss Darrell. Oh, you know who I am. I saw you in Joan of Arc. Did you like it? I thought it stank. Are you always so truthful? Oh, I'm seldom truthful, but I'm always honest. There's a difference. Well, of course. Truth can be destructive, but honesty is always kind. Truth can be cruel. Ward, come in. My goodness, it's been a long time. Well, hello, Nancy. Miss Darrell sent word she wanted to see me. How is she, anyhow? Oh, I really can't say. Well, she's not sick. And she's sure been acting funny. She's a change. <laughs> Michael. Hi. Hello. So Susan. glad to see you again, Michael. Well, Susan, what's the matter with you? Is something the matter with me? <laughs> oh, guys, I'm dumb. But seeing you in that suit and those woolen stockings and your hair plastered back and the eyeglasses, well... I thought you must be rehearsing for a play. I am not rehearsing for a play, Michael. Oh, uh, here, I uh, I brought you some flowers. That's sweet, but you shouldn't have done it. Oh, that wasn't anything. I didn't mean it that way. Flowers should never be picked. Well, I didn't pick them. I got them at the floor. Excuse me. Oh, pardon me, sir. I I thought this was Miss Darrell's apartment. Oh, Susan. Come in, Roger. Oh, hello, Mike. Hello, Roger. Hey, will you get a load of her? 
What are you made up for, Susan? An anarchist? External appearances have no bearing on internal harmony. Meaning? Meaning that I've changed a great deal since I last saw you two. You certainly have. I used to dress frivolously. Now I realize I was dressing only to attract men. That was truthful, but it wasn't honest. Hmm? When a woman dresses to appeal to all men, that's not honest. Oh. Just truthful. But when she dresses to appeal to only one man, that's not truthful, but it's honest. Do you understand? No. You understand, don't you, Mike? Oh, 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 sure, sure. Who's the man? What man? The man you're dressing honestly for so you won't be truthful. Oh. Well, he's the reason I've asked you and Mike to come here. His new book would make an excellent play. Brave, courageous, intelligent. And I feel it's only fair to give you two the first opportunity of financing and producing it. Naturally, I will play the lead. Hmm. Here is the book. Man Has a Mission by William Anthony. Yes. Give me a ring after you've read it, gentlemen. Good day. <laughs> Susan, over here. Hello, William. Here, I ordered a drink for you. Well, what'd they say? Burton and Ward. Naturally, they're very interested. Good. 16 standard steel twin screw cruisers. What did you say? Uh, 16 standard steel twin screw cruisers. The little test I make when I drink alcohol. I've already had a couple. But what about the 16? Well, standard... as long as I can say it, I know I'm all right. Well, I should think so. I couldn't say it in the first place. You see, alcohol affects me most peculiarly. I get too much, I lose all restraint. I agree with everybody. Really? All I can say is yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't people take advantage of you? Well, that's why I'm so cautious. Susan, look. Hmm? That couple over there on the corner, kissing. Poor children. They know of no other form of expressing their simple inclination. Pathetic. However, there's a possibility that under certain conditions, the kiss might be a catalytic agent of a higher spiritual communion. No, I suppose so. But our relationship is on such a high, a serial plane, we can discard such primitive methods. Well, before we do, maybe we should prove it. All right. Give me a kiss. Feel any different? Yes. Yes, I think I do. Me too. My plane's much higher. I, I, I think I just passed the moon. I hear celestial hearts playing Rachmaninoff's prelude. Waiter, a couple of more drinks. Sixteen standard squints, uh, seven... Cancel them, waiter. Just the check. Where are we going? How about dinner? My apartment? Your apartment? With Susan. You're not afraid, are you? Why should I be afraid? Good. Look, you run on home and give me about an hour. You've never tasted my cooking. Say, you should see me with a steak. I brought around the plant up to the Come in. My name's Ward. Mike Ward. Ah, oh, how do you do? Well, I see you've got my book with you. Yeah, and I just finished it. You don't believe in marriage, huh? Listen, Susan's a very nice girl. And she's got to stay that way, partner, if I have to poke you in the nose. Now, now wait a minute. I, I, I think you've got me all wrong. And look at this room. All set for little Red Riding Hood, huh? Oh, even Gardenia's by her dinner plate. Well, you don't think Susan's coming here, do you? Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's ridiculous. It's... Open the door. Oh, there's nobody there. They're, <laughs> they're, they're always buzzing the bell. <laughs> Kids, you know. <laughs> they like to ring bells. <laughs> Open the door. Uh, all right. Roger. Hello, Mike. Hello, Anthony. Oh, well, Mike, glad to see you. I didn't know you two knew each other. Well, of course I knew him. I was expecting him. Uh, wasn't I? Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. What's cooking? Steaks. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ward, but there isn't enough for you. Come in the kitchen, Roger. I want to show them to you. Pardon me for not showing you out, Mr. Ward. I don't quite get this. Whew. Look, you're, you're Mr. Burton, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I thought you were. Look, will you help me get rid of that guy? I'm afraid he'll make trouble when he finds out Susan's coming here. Well, how did you know she was coming here? Her maid. Look, I can explain everything. You're a sensible man, but that lug out there, why, he's out for murder. Is that Susan? Oh, it must be. Oh, help me, will you? Hey, somebody's at the door. Does this kitchen door lead into the hall? Yeah, yeah. Okay, keep your shirt on. I'll install Buffalo Bill for a while. Hey, you want I should answer it? I beg your pardon, Mr. Ward. Did you say something? There's somebody at the door. Oh, nonsense. Hey, now, look, are you going to start this all over again? What over again? The door. Well, uh you're hearing things, go open it and see. I will. There, you see? Nobody. Well, I'll be doggone. I just thought I saw somebody. Sorry, I had to gag you, Susan. You may talk now. Will you kindly tell me the meaning of this? I'm trying to avert a tragedy. What? I can't tell you here in the hall. Walk around the block and I'll explain everything. You better have that's all you better have. Yeah, 
hadn't gone in. If you'd gone into the Anthony's apartment, Mike would have murdered him. I'd appreciate it very much if you and Mike would get it into your heads that I'm a full-grown and in my right mind. Anyone who doesn't realize that that Anthony guy is a phony just hasn't got a mind. Bill Anthony happens to be one of the most brilliant men in the whole country. He's a stinker. You think he's in love with you. Well, why shouldn't he be? Have you ever mentioned the word marriage? Well... We just haven't got to it yet. No, and you never will. He wouldn't marry you if you were the last Oh, he wouldn't, huh? No, he wouldn't, huh? Ask him. You wouldn't happen to be jealous, would you, Mr. Burton? Please, but I know that's why you're hanging around him, to make me jealous. Is that what you think? Why, you conceited, overbearing, arrogant... Con contemptible. You asked for this, Roger. Uh, ooh, you little... There. Oh! Go. Oh. Oh. Susan, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to slash you. Please! Just... Oh, no, please. Susan, Susan, I said I was sorry. Um, please, please. Uh, 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 Nancy, please, please, please. Good night, madam. Oh, please, please. Well, Aitken, while all that was going on in the street, I was upstairs with Mike here. A couple of minutes, the phone rang with Susan. I escaped through the kitchen door and met her. I must have had a few cocktails because that's all I remember the next two hours. When I came to, I was in Susan's car and she was driving somewhere in the country. Do you feel better now, darling? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bill, I want to ask you just one question. Yes, sir. Do you... Do you love me enough to marry me? Yes, sir. You're sure? Yes, sir. Well, he's somewhere down this road, the Justice of the Peace. Yes, sir. You're sure you know what you're doing? Yes, sir. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. Oh, Bill, you poor trusting idiot. You don't want to get married. You just want to get sober. We're turning around, Bill. I'm going to take you home. Well, that's how Susan and I didn't get married. Frankly, I'm sorry she didn't take advantage of me. Well, Mr. Burton, Mr. Ward, Mr. Anthony, <clears throat> thank you very much. I feel that with the aid of this very informative discussion, uh, I shall be able to carry out my program with maximum efficiency. Program? Susan and I are leaving on the midnight plane tonight. Tonight? We'll be married at my mother's home in Pasadena. Pasadena? That's me. Well, good night. I'd better be running along now. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, uh, gentlemen, where are you going? Get out of my way. Uh, hold that elevator. Feet. Wait, wait. Oh, good evening, Nancy. Will you please tell Miss Darrell I'm here? I'm sorry, but she isn't in, Mr. Uh, she isn't in? Where is she? Hello, maybe this is Susan. Hello, Nancy. I want to see Miss Darrell. Uh, she isn't in. Who says she's not in? She does. The maid. Where's Susan? She telephoned a little while ago. She'll be here in a minute. Oh. The Oakleys. She finally decided to have dinner with her. Now, see here, gentlemen. Miss Darrell and I are engaged to be married. The place is busier than a meat market. Susan! Oh, Susan, oh, darling. Susan, well, what is this? A family reunion? Well, I'm afraid it was my fault. He yes. invited us to dinner. To pump us about you. Well, I wanted to find out where they were wrong so I wouldn't make the same mistakes. You understand? Oh, oh, Susan, honey. I misjudge you. Before it's too late, won't you give me another try? Why, Mike, you're proposing. Yeah. And I'm proposing, too. Oh, not you, Bill. Yes, dear. I've discovered you're worth more than all my theories. Well, I'm doing all right. You don't know what this means to a woman of my age. Give them their answers quickly, Susan. We've got to hurry to the airport. Oh, yes. Well, Mike, darling, no. I see. And Bill? Yeah. No, Bill. But I want you to know how flattered I am. Well, isn't there a delegate missing? Well, from what he's told us of your battles, you could hardly expect Roger to... No. I guess I couldn't, could I? Uh, dear, I hate to rush you, but our plane... Excuse me, gentlemen. Richard is right. Oh, uh, I'll be in my room, Richard. Uh, yes, of course. Well, well good night, Richard, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Guy. Good night, our gentlemen. Yes. Yes. What am I going to do? Oh, what am I going to do now? Why didn't he come? Who does he think he... Nancy? Uh -uh. Is it? That... What are you doing in my room? Well, I had a hunch the living room was going to be a bit crowded. What do you want? To talk to you. About another play, I suppose. Well, yes, I thought we could go up to Uncle Jimmy's and rehearse like we did that very first time. We could get married on the way up there. And what makes you think I'd ever marry you again? Because you still love me. What about... What about Mike and... And, and Bill and... And the stuff shirt? Well, just a phase of your development. The trouble with you was you never kissed the mailman. I guess some of it was my fault, too. I waited a long time to hear you say that, Roger. Well, what do you say? I wouldn't marry you if you were... Come in. 
Uh, Susan, you'll have to... Uh, what goes on here? Everywhere I go, men crawling out of the woodwork. Richard, I think there's something you ought to know. We couldn't make a go of it. Uh, well, I was afraid of that, but I was hoping you wouldn't find out. Oh, Mother will be terribly disappointed. So, goodbye, Richard. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> well, that settles that. Now we've got to unpack these bags. Why? Well, you can't go up to Uncle Jimmy's dress as though you're going to California. Get those blue jeans on, little checkered shirt that you used to wear. Uh, hey. Yes, Roger? The blue jeans and the shirt. You've packed them already. Did I? Oh, but that's ridiculous. I certainly had no intention of going to the island. Oh, what a woman. From now on, my life's going to be miserable. Come here. Oh, oh it's good to be in your arms again, Roger. It makes me wonder and wonder. Yes? Why you ever left me? No, dear. About the mailman. Yeah. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Now, just the other day, one of my neighbors in Hollywood asked me... Why is it, Mr. Kennedy, that my grocer is sometimes out of Lux Flakes? Now that the war is over, I should think we'd have more of everything. It's true the fighting war is over, but we still can't get all the fats and oils this country needs for peacetime industries. Oils are needed not only to make soap, but to turn machines of every sort, even for plastics and synthetic rubber. The plantations in the Far East that used to send us millions of pounds of fats and oils were left in ruins by the Japanese. Well, can't we get fat from somewhere else? Yes, we can, from your kitchen. That's why the government asks every housewife to save and keep on saving for some time to come every drop of fat from frying pan and broiler. Thousands of industries are depending on used fats for reconversion so they can turn out the washing machines, automobiles, tires, and nylon stockings you want. Do butchers still give points for used fat? Yes, indeed. Not two points, but four points and four cents for every pound. So you can see how important the government thinks fat salvage is. Think how much those extra four points will buy now. Half a pound of butter or ten ounces of bacon. Does saving fats help to make soap more plentiful, too? Yes. Industry gets the used fats, and this releases the fine oils for soap making. So when you save used fats, you're helping industry reconvert faster, helping yourself to get more rationed meats and fats, and more of all things you want sooner. We return you to Mitchell Lyson. Now that we've settled the affairs of Susan, here's that charming lady in real life. Miss Joan Fontaine, sharing a well-deserved curtain call with George Brent and Don DeFore. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks. Ooh. <laughs> it's good to be working with you again. Yeah. Tell me, Mitch, is it true that uh, what you said earlier about you and Joan running your own housekeeping establishment uh, when you were making Frenchman's Creek? Mm, it sure is. And with an ex-actor like Mitchell Lyson, you didn't get just eggs for breakfast. You got eggs and Hamlet. Ouch. Well, Joan, you never heard anybody kick about the meals at my house. No, they only kicked about having to get them. What was your specialty of the house, Mitch? Well, I, I used to serve fried chicken that sort of uh, tickled everybody's palate. What was the matter? They leave the feathers on? Now, listen, aside from that, I admit I was sort of a flash in the pantry. <laughs> you mean, Mitch, your cooking wasn't delectable, delicious, and delightful? No, just delightful. Uh, what are you cooking up for the Lux next week, Mitch? Well, we have something pretty special, George. In his first appearance since the war on this or any other sponsored program, one of the screen's most popular and outstanding personalities. Just out of uni uniform, he's Jimmy Stewart. Oh, congratulations, Mitch. You must be mighty happy to have Jimmy in his first radio play. And co-starred with him is another favorite of this theater, Joan Blondell. Well, you must have had a hard time picking a play to match those stars, Mitch. No, we let Jimmy himself do that. We gave him a free choice of the play he most wanted to do and the role he most wanted to impersonate. And he's chosen one of his favorite pictures and one of our favorite Jimmy Stewart roles, in Universal's thrilling Western melodrama, Destry Rides Again. It's a great play for Joan Blondell and Jimmy, Mitch, and good night. Good, good night. night. Good night, and our thanks to all of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Jimmy Stewart and Joan Blondell in Destry Rides Again. This is Mitchell Lyson saying good night to you from Hollywood. The Affairs of Susan was presented through the courtesy of Hal Wallace, whose current production is Love Letters, starring Jennifer Jones and Joseph Cotton. Mitchell Lyson's next picture to be released is Paramount's Masquerade in Mexico. 
Joan Fontaine appeared through the courtesy of David O. Selznick, producers of Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Don DeFore is currently appearing in the Hal Wallace production, You Came Along. Will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Stork Club. This week, Hollywood launched one of its biggest personal appearance tours of veterans' hospitals and convalescent centers. More than 30 leading stars from major companies will donate their time and that of the studios to entertaining wounded servicemen from coast to coast. Hollywood players have pledged their continued personal appearances whenever and wherever they are called upon to entertain our veterans. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Destry Rides Again with Jimmy Stewart and Joan Blondell.